I was saying, Joe, that you have a quarantined hairdo. Yes, yes, I do. All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom event. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I'll be your host for today. First of all, on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so happy to see all of you joining us today. National Geographic believes in the power of exploration and wonder to change the world. The heart of our National Geographic community is our explorers, who are cutting edge scientists and researchers, transformative educators, and powerful storytellers. Explorer Classroom's live video events connect students with National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and extended Q&As. In a commitment to supporting educators, students, and families during this transition, we are now providing Explorer Classroom every weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern. So if you like, you can join us right back here again this afternoon. We're also mixing in some really cool events from the field when we can, uh, which we're doing today, and those are obviously at different time slots. So today we are very lucky to be connecting with Paul Salopek. Paul is in Myanmar right now. Paul is on a 21,000 mile out of Eden walk, tracing the pathways of the first humans who migrated out of Africa. His journey will take him from the southern, or sorry, from Ethiopia to the southernmost tip of South America, Terra del Fuego. Along the way, he is practicing slow journalism, meeting people and recording their stories while covering the major stories of our time from climate change to technological innovation, from mass migration to cultural survival. His words, as well as his photographs, videos, and audio create a global record of human life at the start of a new millennium as told by villagers, nomads, traders, farmers, soldiers, and artists who rarely make the news. So in just a minute, I'm gonna throw things over to Paul. But before I do, I wanna acknowledge that we are joined by a ton of groups on Canada, or sorry, on camera from across North America. We also have a ton of groups starting to join us live via YouTube. And I'm gonna do a ton of shout outs as we get a little further on, but I know we've got groups in Canada, in the US, joining us in the UK. We've got some groups joining us from the Middle East, uh, India. So we have a ton of groups joining us live today. Always great to see everybody with us. All right, that's enough for me. Let's throw things over to Paul. Paul, it's so great to see you today. The internet connection seems to be holding so far. Uh, let's keep our fingers crossed. Great, it's great to be here, Joe, and it's great to be with the larger community of classrooms around the world. It's always fun uh, for me. Um, under these extraordinary circumstances where all of us can't really travel the way we, we used to, I'm happy to uh, take you guys on a little bit of a global walk today um, that started seven years ago. Uh, we just logged, uh, my cartographer at Harvard just logged, I think the mileage right now is 11,280 miles. Uh, that's well over 20,000 kilometers. Uh, well, close to 20,000, excuse me. So. Um, I'm happy to take questions uh, at the end of this presentation. And what I'd like to do, Joe, and uh, uh, for everybody on, on this uh, interaction is just kind of run through what the project is about, because I suspect that we have some new, some new students and learners and teachers uh, who are just getting acquainted with this long foot journey. All right, you ready for me to rock a screen share, Paul? Let's do it. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna just go off the screen, guys, and Joe's gonna put some slides on some maps and some photographs and, and a video. And I'm gonna kind of talk through it. Um, I'll try to be as brief as I can because I wanna get to your questions. Um, that's the real fun part. Um, so right. let's go and... Uh, so we should be full screen now, Paul. Yep, I see it, got it. So basically what I'm doing folks is I'm, I'm walking across the world, but not randomly. I'm not kind of doing it as a, as a sports challenge or kind of for a reality show or for some kind of personal you know, fitness challenge, although, you know, there's that involved. I am a, a scientist by education. I'm a biologist, uh, my degree is in biology, and I've, I've come into a different career in my life of telling stories uh, as a journalist. And so this project, the Out of Eden Walk, combines bo both of those, kind of art and science, if you will, um, storytelling with the, the science of ancient human migrations. And what you see up there is, uh, is more or less the map of what our ancestors uh, traveled 60 to 100,000 years ago. You see that the red is kind of where our species Homo sapiens originated. That's in the mother continent of Africa. All of us on this call are African, if you go far back enough in your family tree. And these lines represent sort of um, corridors of, of human um, dispersals, right? Into north into Europe, uh, then east into Eurasia. Some folks went down into Australia and the Pacific Islands using, you know, primitive uh, uh, sea craft uh, and others then walked kind of the hardcore walkers went over the the uh, Siberian to Alaskan uh, land bridge back then um, down and through 
of the Americas to the tip of South America. So this is a migration nobody really knows exactly, but the best evidence uh, is that this probably took 2,500 generations, 50,000 years at least, to, to spread out of Africa and basically uh, explore the world. This is the first exploration of the world. Next image. You know, nobody knows exactly who these folks were, who these ancestors were. Thank you, Joe. Um, uh, it was a long time ago. It was before the invention of writing. It was before the invention of record keeping. All we have are some artifacts and some, some, some fossils and some genetic evidence. And using DNA, scientists have been able to kind of piece together uh, sort of maybe who uh, and these people were and what was their culture like. Again, these are common ancestors to all of us. And, and they've, by doing uh, studies across the world, uh, DNA studies and populations you know, from every country, every region, they have been able to identify sort of where the oldest genomes are, some of the oldest sort of gene markers. And not surprisingly, they're in Africa. And fingers are pointing towards this region in Southern Africa where a group, these are the, the Khoisan people, these are their uh, so-called Bushmen who live in the Kalahari Desert, live in Botswana. Uh, a few of them still are hunter-gatherers today, but um, our ancestors who first kind of discovered the world for us may have looked something like this. Next image. Uh, Joe, did you hear? Um, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, Paul, it went to the next one. It might just be a bit slower on yep. your end. Um, uh, can, can, can you guys still hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So I use evidence like uh, fossil um, evidence. Uh, the, this is a scientist. And... Yep, sounds good, Joe. Um, so uh, the, again, I use archeological evidence. I use anthropology. Uh, and this is a scientist looking at the oldest skull ever found outside of Africa, 1.8 million years old to help draw the map of where to go, right? Next image. Hey, Paul, if you can hear me, I think your link uh, might just be a little bit behind ours. But um, when you say next image, you can trust that I've got to change to the next one. Oh, and we just lost Paul. So uh, we'll just put a pause for a second. So as mentioned, Paul is in Myanmar. Hey. Oh, you still there, Paul? OK. OK. Yeah, I just came back on. So can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, you're back now, Paul. Maybe keep your camera off and just trust that when you say next slide, I've gone to the next one. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, Joe, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Okay, will do. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, I've got my camera off and uh, I'll... All right, folks, so we're going to keep our fingers crossed that we get Paul back. As mentioned, we've been pretty lucky so far. His signal in uh, Myanmar is not very good. There's a lot of people uh, trying to use the internet at the same time right now. Um, I can see he's joined the call again. Yep. Can you hear me, Joe? Yeah, we've got you, Paul. Let's keep Hello? the camera off and see what we can do. Joe, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Paul. Let me 
Maybe if I send you a message, that'll be easier. Yep. I'm going to try to go quickly now um, because the folks I'm in, I'm in Northern. Okay. So um, let's try to get through the slideshows as quickly as we can. The, the sick getting worse. So, okay. Uh, can you go to the, the uh, map, Joe? Number five. We're there. Yep, Joe, I don't know if you could still hear me or not. Yeah, we got you, Paul. I'm on uh, slide five. I'm on the map. OK, so. Uh, that's my route. So, you know, using science to determine where our ancestors went, I'm trying to follow their footsteps. And that red line is more or less where I'm trying to go. You see, out of Africa, I've walked into the Middle East through Central Asia. And now I'm headed towards the tip of South America, as Joe said, Chile and Argentina. I'm right now in Burma. Next image. Uh, next slide, if you can hear me. It's there, Paul. It just might be slow for you on your end. Uh, Joe, if you can't hear me, uh, um, sorry, folks. Paul's obviously has a delay on his end. Um, so he thinks we can't hear him, but we can. So let me try and just let him know in a message that we can hear him. Paul? Yeah, Joe, I keep dropping. The line keeps dropping. I think it's an unstable connection. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, Paul. Um, you might not see the slides change on your end, but we can hear you uh, and the slides are changed. I do have it up at, at the uh, next Joe, time. can you hear me? Yeah, I can, Paul. Yeah, I think the, yeah. Okay, so, um, can you hear me? Okay, so why don't you just, uh, so let's just go through these quickly. Uh, um, the next slide should be a young, a young lady who's uh, an Afar pastoralist yep. at the starting line. Joe, can you hear me? I can, Paul. Yep, can you hear me? Yeah, but it keeps dropping off after every four or five seconds. I think if this yeah. continues, we either have to call a, a rain day, or if you are on WhatsApp, I can try calling on WhatsApp, and you can basically use the audio against your your mic. Uh, yeah. So we can troubleshoot as you as you as you wish. Yeah, you know um, what? Let's let's if you drop one more time shoot me a message and we'll do that audio way. Um, yeah. What's that? Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's do that. I'll just, you know, maybe email me your, your phone number that's on what's up and I'll, I'll yeah. ping you as soon as it soon as we drop and then we can continue. Just hold your, you know, I guess your phone up near the mic and you, people can hear me at least uh, yeah. via what's up. So anyway, um, this is a, just a young lady who's, who's belongs to an ethnic group at the starting line. They're camel nomads. And it was this group of people that I joined uh, to begin my walk uh, across the world. So next image. And this is what it looks like, right? This is uh, the Ethiopian desert in the Rift Valley of Africa. And that's a team of uh, paleoanthropologists, fossil hunters looking for some of the first uh, you know, fossils of humans, early humans. And at this site, they've located them uh, about 160,000 years old. Next image.
So what, what do you carry when you're, when you're walking across the world and, and trying to take down stories? Um, this is what I started with in the beginning. You can see a, lap, a laptop, uh, there's a solar panels outside, there's a satellite dish, a portable one, uh, all kinds of adapters, a video camera, an audio recorder. It was a lot, it was too much, all right? Now keep in mind, this is seven years ago, which is like, you know, back in the stone age when it comes to tech. Uh, and I've been able to basically reduce almost all of this stuff, except for the laptop, down to my phone. So I basically record the entire project using an iPhone. Now compare this image to the next image. This is what my walking partners in Ethiopia carried by contrast. Look at that. Talk about efficiency. Um, these are, again, camel nomads who, who wander this semi-arid zone, pushing animals around. And they carry a, a, an axe and that they use to chop down, you know, bushes to make fires or to create shelters. Um, they've got a big knife there uh, for self-defense, um, and uh, they've got a, you know, kind of a homemade water bottle. Uh, they've got some some cloth to sleep on. The most important thing uh, is a little a little container next to that red matchbox, which contains their snuff. These guys are, are addicted to tobacco. <laughs> next image. All right, folks, after a stable connection for a couple of minutes, I think we may have lost Paul, which means he's going to call me on WhatsApp, which should be less of a strain on his end. And we're going to continue uh, that way. So when we do connect yeah, from Joe, I think what I'll try. Is, um, yeah. I'm Go going ahead. to try to get you on WhatsApp. Yeah, let's do that. Yep, I sent you the number. Okay, give me give me a few seconds here. Yep, no worries, Paul. Uh, while we do wait for Paul to give me a call back on WhatsApp, I will talk a little bit about the challenge that we're issuing for students who are tuning into the event today. So if you're tuning in from kindergarten to grade five, your challenge is to draw a picture or make a comic strip about Paul's walk uh, that he's been on. Uh, if you are from grade six to grade eight, your challenge is to uh, make a news article about Paul's uh, walk so far, his journey so far. And then finally, if you're in high school, your challenge is to make uh, a video about Paul's walk so far, something you learn from his walk. Um, you can find lots of little footage uh, from his walk online if you do search the Out of Eden walk. And then another option too, if you search Out of Eden Learn uh, on Google, you'll find a website with all kinds of resources um, that can be used uh, by classrooms. Oh, there's Paul. Here we go. Hey, Paul. Okay, uh, Joe, can you, can you hear me okay? I, I can, yep. Great, so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to leave the meeting to keep uh, bandwidth open and I'm just gonna talk to you on what's up and, and go through these images. Yep. Uh, so if everybody can hear me, um, uh, sorry about this. This is the story of, of walking around the world in, in somewhat less wired areas. This is a daily, a daily issue dealing with communications. It's actually kind of nice to know, isn't it, though, that parts of the world aren't so highly wired that we kind of have to rely on uh, the old fashioned method of just talking to each other face to face. <laughs> it's certainly that way here in northern Burma. So, uh, Joe, I, I kind of don't know what image we were last on. Was it the the kid of the pastoralists? Uh, uh, the, one, the image after that is a guy walking a camel. That's where we are, Paul. Can you see that one? Yep. Okay, so um, that's my first walking partner. And this is an important photo for two reasons, folks. One is uh, I have to emphasize that this is not like one person's walk around the world. It's not just me. I'm always accompanied. Um, I always have walking partners who are from the region who act not just as translators to kind of overcome language barriers, but they interpret you know, the local landscape for me, the local culture, folklore, et cetera, as well as keep me safe. So this is a collective journey, just like our ancestors wandered out of Africa way back in the Stone Age together. They relied on each other. They traveled in groups of say 20 to 40 people. Uh, and you, you know, your survival literally depended on, on the person next to you. Um, so it is with my journey across the world. I depend for my, for my work uh, and my well-being on people like uh, Alema Hassan, who's the chap walking 
uh, in front of the camel there with the Ethiopian flag wrapped around his neck. Next image. Just let me know when it's up, uh, Joe. Yeah, Paul, uh, just trust that I've, I've got it up. I'll pop it up when you say next image. Okay, okay, great. So that's a, so after reaching uh, the, the sea, you know, I, I walked up the Rift Valley of Africa to the Gulf of Aden. I had a, had a problem that our ancestors had. I reached an ocean, right? What do you do? I mean, what do you do? You, our ancestors could either turn left or right, walk up and down a beach. I, I kind of cheated a little bit on this project and am using um, the, uh, the availing myself to modern technology in the form of shipping. Um, so um, taking a boat, this is a camel and goat boat across the Red Sea from Africa to Saudi Arabia. Uh, and I believe on this ship, there were about 8,000 um, uh, um, 8, goats and 900 camels um, on this boat. Next image. Okay. So what we have here is walking through um, walking through uh, Saudi Arabia on uh, on foot across the Hejaz Desert, um, and uh, what you see there are a couple cargo camels. Um, I'm sorry, folks, but you're going to put up with some camel pictures because I really like camels. But this is through a really hyper hyper dry part of the Arabian Peninsula, uh, and uh, I had a couple camels to carry water and food between wells, following old uh, uh, Tariq al Hajj. These are old kind of pilgrimage routes for Muslim pilgrims who had been walking on foot to Mecca, uh, their sacred city, um, for hundreds and hundreds of years, and we were following those from well to well, making our way north into uh, the Middle East. Next image. So what you see here is kind of what, uh, you know, middle-aged guys in North America kind of wash their, their pickup trucks on the lawn on weekends. And so I figured why not translate, transmit this uh, tradition to the, the Saudi desert and that's just washing one of my camels there uh, at a rest stop. Next image. So this is a picture um, of, believe it or not, this is Jerusalem. And I like this picture for a couple of reasons. It's it, number one, um, you know, when we see kind of these very pretty, beautiful, iconic images of, of cities around the world, not, you know, whether it's Jerusalem or Moscow or Washington, D.C. or New York or what have you, um, they're often like in the downtown and they're often kind of showing the most important tourist sites, right, of those cities. When you walk across the world, you have to literally walk in from the edge of a big city down to the center. Some cases that takes days, right? Um, I mean, I've walked across cities on this walk um, that has taken three or four days to actually get through them because we live in gigantic cities right now. That gives me an advantage that very few other people who visit these cities have, which is to kind of walk a transect, walk a line from one end to the other of a city to see its edges, its suburbs, its inner core, how, how you know, the population changes, how the architecture changes. You walk through poor neighborhoods, you walk through rich neighborhoods, you see the good with the bad. You get a real, real um, true take of that city. So this is kind of coming in from the south uh, on the desert edge of Jerusalem. The other reason I like this picture is because that, that fencing in the front tells you something about Jerusalem. It's both one of the most diverse and vibrant cities in the world, but also one of the most divided, right? It's divided between different groups, religious groups, ethnic groups. Um, it's a very contested uh, urban center, as the next picture will show. Next image. So what I do is I walk through cities across the world on my route. I do what I call city walk maps. And I've got a GPS, of course, attached to my, you know, to me, it's in my pocket. It's, it's pinging a satellite every 30 seconds and giving a location. These are then uh, strung together, these, these waypoints into a map. And I like to take a, a walking tour of every city that I walk through and collect photos, do audio recordings, interview people along the way, so that if, if anybody in the future wants to walk through the city and, and find these places, they can find them by basically just tapping into the same walking route. And this is Jerusalem. 
And you could see there was no easy way to kind of meet all the different people that are in this ancient city. So my walking partners and I walked with, a, with an Israeli and a Palestinian, um, uh, corkscrewed from the edge into the center, kind of touching on all the different subcultures in this city. Next image. So leaving the Middle East, you know, I, I bumped into the Syrian war in the north, and of course it was too dangerous to cross on foot. So um, I took a ship across the Mediterranean, a cargo ship, landed in Turkey. That's where this picture is. And uh, that's what my, my Kurdish walking partner, Murat Yazad, a photographer, and our, our 22 year old mule. Um, this was a very uh, sturdy, hardy, very ancient mule uh, who walked with us for well over a thousand kilometers or 600 miles across Anatolia. Next image. So people sometimes ask, Paul, so you're walking across the world, you're, you're, you're never taking cars or planes or trains, um, you're going year after year, um, where do you sleep? And the answer is wherever sunset finds me, right? Sometimes if it's, in a, if it's in a wilderness, I camp out, you know, I take a sleeping bag. If I'm in a populated area and it's a small town, I might kind of stay with a farmer on a farm. Uh, or if I'm in a big city, I'll do what everybody does. I'll find a cheap lodging somewhere, you know, a guest house. But here in this part of the world, this is Turkey. I also had the advantage of availing myself to sleep in places of public worship. This is a mosque, very pretty one, hand-painted by the, the imam's family. His kids uh, de decorated it. And these two chaps are my, my walking partners through that part of Turkey. Next image. So... Um, People ask, how do you get across borders? And, you know, I do it the same way everybody who's traveling overland does. Local people have to contend with the difficulties and challenges of borders. It's always a tense moment to go across a border. You know, you're kind of, you're, the, the guard looks you up and down, kind of like almost like you're a criminal. And, and you have to kind of just, you know, smile and then, you know, prove to them that you're coming in. You've got a visa. You've got the permits. You're not carrying any contraband. Um, this, this picture is from a very hot border, a very contested difficult border back in 2014, just about a year after I walked out of Africa. The Syrian war was really heating up. It was, it was turning into a massive tragedy with millions of displaced people. And these are Turkish uh, soldiers guarding the Turkish border against um, Syrian refugees. Next image. Now, at the same place where, that, where those soldiers were standing, just turning around, if you just pivoted on your heel and turned 180 degrees around to look behind you, this is what you saw. Hundreds Scores of thousands of people fleeing a city called Kobani. These are all Syrian refugees behind the barbed wire of the Turkish border. And, and aid workers are throwing them pieces of bread. This is a picture by my colleague, John Stanmeyer, uh, who's been coming to visit me on the trail for seven years to take beautiful images and heartbreak, heartbreaking images too. Um, my project is about following ancient human migrations, paradoxically, strangely, by, you know, ironically, I'm walking through a period of an, in our history today at the turn of the 21st century when um, there's also enormous numbers of people who are migrating, who are putting with their feet, leaving their homelands because of economic reasons or because of war, what have you. The United Nations uh, statistics that I've seen say that up to one in every seven people alive today in the world has been is on the move, either leaving their villages and moving into big cities and within their country or crossing borders. Next image. So this is just a pretty picture uh, shot by Murat Yazad, my, my, my Kurdish walking partner, of us kind of moving out of the Caucasus and we're headed into um, slowly inching into Central Asia. Next image. So um, I walked through Central Asia for more than two years. It was really, really long, many, many countries. Most of the Stans, right? Uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan. I walk through them all. And what united this experience kind of historically across deserts, and here you see a chalk desert in Kazakhstan um, that could be, you know, a, a national park, a monument anywhere in the world. It was the Silk Road, right? I was basically following the old Silk Roads, which are not just one road, but a whole network of roads, including shipping lanes. But in this case, you know, these are old camel trails and footpaths across the belly of the Asian continent. Uh, so I was able to kind of tell stories about, you know, old, you know, globalization versus new globalization today. This is like the first kind of globalized network of trade uh, in the world, 2000 years old. Next image. Um, you know, when you're out walking across the world and you kind of, you don't really know where you're going the next day, you're just kind of taking a compass bearing. 
you don't know where you're going to get water. And so this is a picture, if you can imagine that, that last slide of that desert, this is in that same desert. Um, we are walking uh, with cargo animals and they're carrying water. But if you, if you get a chance to stop at a well, you stop and replenish your supplies. And in this case, we came across a train that was idling on a railroad track in the middle of nowhere. You know, just imagine horizons that are pancake flat as far as the eye can see. And there's this train waiting on a siding, I guess, for another train to pass. And we went up to the engineer and said, do you have any water? And he said, yeah, there's a tanker car behind me. And so that's what this is. We're just taking a, a shower uh, from a train's tanker uh, car. Um, and this was about, gosh, 45 degrees centigrade, you know, well, you know, above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Next image. And so, you know, why do you take a shower? It was because you want to be presentable when you arrive at the next town or village. And so this is just a nice shot of a nice memory of walking into Kyrgyzstan, a small community um, on uh, the Orthodox Russian New Year's Eve. And this is an ethnic Russian family who are celebrating that night and they took us in. And uh, we, we danced uh, the night away with them. Next image. So there's no real kind of standard day when you walk across the world. As the last slide shows, sometimes there's like socializing, there's a party, you know, you talk to people, you get to know their kids, you take, you know, you do, you do interviews, you take photos, you ask how their life is, you know, is climate change affecting your life if you're a farmer, you know, how is politics or economics affecting your life. And then, you know, a few weeks later, you're walking through a wilderness where there's nobody. And in this case, this is a shot by Matthew Paley, another National Geographic photographer who has joined me on the trail of Afghanistan. This is the Afghan North coming through the Hindu Kush, a very desolate, depopulated area, very beautiful. Um, very few outsiders go through here. I had the great privilege of walking through. It's called the Wahan Corridor. Next image. And in the process of going through Afghanistan, I had to cross some of the highest mountains in the world. These are the Hindu Kush. And this was kind of waking up one morning after snow when Matthew and I were trying to walk over a major mountain pass that was, I think, uh, more than 5,000 meters high. That's, I think, about 16 or 17,000 feet. Um, next image. And so um, after coming out of Central Asia into Afghanistan and then Pakistan, um, I've been spending the last you know, year and a half moving through Southern Asia into Southeast Asia. And this is a map that's just fresh off the presses. Um, this was made by uh, my walking partner in India, Siddharth Agarwal. He's a, he's a terrific uh, person. He's a, a river conservationist and also himself an avid walker. He, Sid has walked 5,000 kilometers at least through rivers in India doing the same sort of thing that I am, recording, um, you know, people's lives and looking at environmental conditions. And he did this map. You, you probably can't see it too clearly on your slide, but basically that's color coded. You see little sections of the walking route through northern India. Uh, these colors, these big color blots are, are river watersheds. That's the Indus on the, on the left. That's the, the Ganges or the Ganga in the middle. And then the Brahmaputra and the Irrawaddy on the, on the right. But that color coded line is my, my GPS track. Um, I think that was more than, what was it, 4,000 4, kilometers, something like 2,400 miles. And each color is a different person who walked with me. And it just goes back to this point that I have to reiterate that this is not a, a solo walk. I would not be able to do this without my walking partners. Uh, I, I walked with extraordinary human beings through India, people who are fantastic storytellers, photographers, writers, um, environmentalists, um, you name it. Yeah, I just, I was walking with somebody who knows the area um, is like an education all in itself. So my classroom has been the world foot. Next image. And just to kind of drive that point home, this is uh, leaving India and walking into Burma where I am now. This is the border post. And these are some of my walking partners. These are the people who've made the Out of Even Walk project possible. Uh, and uh, again, they're colleagues, they are co-walkers, and this journey belongs as much to them as it does to you. This is, this is everybody's walk. Um, I think um, the next image is going to be a video, and it's quite short, but um, you need to probably put the cursor on the screen and just start it up, uh, Joe, and, and then turn the audio, you need to talk, turn the audio way up.
Hey, Paul, the video just finished. Okay, great. Well, look, you know, I just wanted to kind of, you could you can go to the last slide, uh, um, the National Geographic cover. I just wanted to show that that um, video because people say, what, what do you get out of a walk that you couldn't get out of like taking a car or a motorcycle or a bicycle or a plane? Well, it's moments like those. It's walking into the hills of, of Manipur in the remote forests of northeastern India and meeting a gentleman who I would never meet alongside the highway. He's an herbalist, kind of like a shaman um, uh, who's using natural medicines. And I just said, you know, can you imitate birds? And for half an hour, this was just a minute. He went on for half an hour imitating dozens and dozens of birds. Um, these are kind of the magic moments that you get by slowing down your life by observing closely, by listening closely. And this is really kind of a listening journey. Um, something that we, I think we miss in our lives by going so quickly. And, you know, something that I think all of us on this call may be rediscovering during this terrible pandemic, right? Because it's forced us to kind of be indoors and kind of forced us to slow down, give up certain habits of kind of speeding to point A to point B and being distracted by all the things that come with speed. So in a sense, we're all taking this journey again, um, even if we're just sitting in our houses or taking walks around our, our, our blocks. So that's it. Um, I think I'll, I'll open it up to questions. Hopefully I'll be able to hear them. Joe, you might have to kind of pass some of them along if I can't hear. Yep, absolutely, Paul. So we have a great group joining us, Paul, uh, from all over the place. Um, Paul, obviously a huge thank you for sharing so much with us. It is an incredible journey. Uh, the people you've met, the places you've seen, uh, the stories that you're sharing are also important. So thanks so much for everything you do, Paul. It's a pleasure. It's an honor. All right. Let's start meeting some of our groups. So we have a, hand, a large amount of students joining us live today. So students, if you do have a question for Paul, you have to click participants at the bottom. And then in the bottom right, you should see an option to raise your hand virtually. So go ahead and do that. And I'll keep an eye out for your little blue hands. But let's get started. Let's, oh, well, we've got one right now already. So let's start with uh, Elena. Let me unmute your microphone. There we go, Elena, you're up. Um, what gave you the idea to walk over, well, to, to walk instead of uh, doing a car? Or like, what gave you the idea in general to do this project thing? Yeah, I, I heard that clearly. Thank you, Lena. Um, good question. It's the kind of the basic question of, you know, how does an idea start? Um, you know, I think the honest answer is it's not that big of a difference from what I've been doing in my life before, but just in smaller, smaller chunks. Um, I've been a reporter in Africa for almost 10 years. And to get to great stories in Africa, where you have to go where the people live. And Africa is a continent where like um, a large number of people still live in the countryside. Um, they have booming cities that are growing fast too, but a large number of people still have a rural lifestyle. And to get there, you have to use your body, right? Because there often isn't the infrastructure, you have to walk. So I got this idea as I was uh, um, trying to write a book and I thought, what would be the next great project to do that would draw on all of my skills and all of my knowledge of having covered you know, everything from wars to um, you know, political elections, to culture, to environmental stories. And I thought, let me just do a journey because everybody likes journeys, but even more so, let's find a journey that, that is not just Paul's journey, but is everybody's journey. And so I used my bio bio biological training, kind of my, my, my kind of knowledge of history uh, and, and evolution and, and human, human origins to kind of tap into the ultimate journey that we all took. Uh, again, if you go far enough back in your, in your own family's history, somebody walked this stretch of the trail going ten, tens of thousands of years back, right? Um, so this is, uh, this is how this story, this uh, journey started. Um, and I discovered that it actually was pretty, pretty easy to do. It sounds pretty you know, sobering to kind of say, I'm going to walk around the world. But once you start, uh, you find out that uh, what a pleasure it is and just sort of how normal and natural it is. It's, it's the way we've evolved. We, we have evolved to be walking machines. Um, so what I'm doing is kind of normal. And what everybody else is doing and what I've done until seven years ago, which is to sit down a lot, is actually what's not normal. All okay. right. So another question here, Paul, I grabbed this one from YouTube. This is from Rumi. And she, uh, Rumi's wondering if you take breaks to visit family and friends. 
Yeah, another good question, Rumi. You know, the idea from the beginning has been to not break the journey to go back home. Um, I want to get into the mindset of the first peoples who, who roamed the earth way back in the Pleistocene. And the way to do that, I thought, was not to kind of take breaks and get on a plane and, you know, go back for a summer. So I've made a deal with the, the people in my life um, that um, I'm going to, as long as they give me permission to, to continue. And so far, it's been that way. Uh, they come out and join me on the trail. And so I walk with them. Uh, and then that, in that way, they also get to participate in, in the journey and in the project. So far, it's worked. All right. We've got... Uh, Gigme joining us in Tennessee. Let me get that microphone turned on. There we go. Uh, we're ready for a question. So how have the environments where you walked been, how, have they, how are they different from how they were when our first ancestors walked along because of climate change and everything? So the same place where our ancestors walked today, it might be a different type of environment than long time ago. So how is that? Is that the case? Yeah, it's a really excellent question. I mean, because, you know, the idea is to kind of make this a learning journey. Um, and, you know, to, to look back at our ancestors, how they adapted to things like climate change, to, to new landscapes, to new environmental challenges, using, you know, nothing near the technology that we do and see if we can get a lesson about resilience, about problem solving from them. And your answer has many, many, uh, it's a complicated answer, but in short, some places may not look terribly, that terribly different. They may not have changed too much in the last 50,000 years, but most of the places have, right? Um, most of the landscapes that I walked across were very heavily impacted by the human um, thumbprint, the few human footprint, if you will, is very big. I mean, it struck me as I look back over my shoulder, looking back to seven years, you know, 11,200 miles of walking, I think it's very, num the number of, of kind of quote unquote natural or unaltered landscapes are very small. I would say on the order of 10% of what I've seen on my trail. And that is mostly through Central Asia, through the wild mountains of, of Central Asia, and then a bit through the Rift Valley of Africa, where there were still a fair number of large animals roaming the landscape. In most places, including for thousands of kilometers, I saw almost no wildlife other than birds and a few reptiles, but all the big animals are gone. Uh, and it's, it's been a pretty sobering uh, realization to see at boot level. I mean, it's one thing to read about it, to see a documentary, but when you're waking up to it every day for seven years, uh, we have really, really impacted this planet. And I think what's going on now, I think some scientists would agree in terms of, you know, climate change and also even the pandemic, which gets passed from wildlife to humans, uh, is a, is a, an indication of of sort of how heavily we've we've disrupted ecosystems around the world, and you know what the bill is coming due, the bill is coming due, and we need to kind of get up and start walking towards a solution, if not running towards one. Good question. All right, great question, and thanks so much for that answer, Paul. Uh, Mrs. Cotter in Concord, Massachusetts. Her students are tuning in live via YouTube. Uh, Mrs. Cotter, can you unmute the microphone for me, and we'll steal a question if if they've sent one into you. Um, they, um, I've noticed on the right hand side of the YouTube that they've asked a couple and one of them was, um, how has COVID-19 affected your journey? Yeah, I heard that. That's another, of course, great question. You guys would make great reporters. You're asking all the right questions. Um, it, it, it has, and it hasn't, um, it, 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 it it has in the sense that, of course, as borders have shut down, now even my way forward, even when you're inching along like a human snail, uh, is blocked. So my next country after Burma, after Myanmar, was going to be Thailand. Well, guess what? That border's been shut for weeks and likely will remain shut for weeks weeks ahead. Um, so I'm in, I'm in a kind of a pause mode. I'm kind of hunkered down. I'm kind of doing everything the doctors say we should do. I'm kind of trying to keep, you know, social distancing going in the small town that I'm in in Northern Burma. Um, and I'm working a lot at home at uh, this guest house that I'm in. But but the reason it hasn't changed too much is just by sheer chance. I'm also, um, I, I designed uh, the walk and planned ahead even a year ago to stop here to finish writing a book. So I'm in book writing mode. And that, you know, as as any author will tell you, that's kind of like being under 
a pandemic quarantine, <laughs> regardless, right? You kind of, you know, have a lonely existence locked in a room trying to, to crank out pages. So in that sense, it's not that much different. All right, Paul, I'm going to grab a question from YouTube here. Um, this is from Cassandra. She's wondering if you plan your walking partners in advance or do you find them as you go? Cassandra, that's another good logistics question. The answer is both. You know, being a, being a journalist, a global journalist is great in the sense that you're basically, you have this vast international network of friends and colleagues in, in many different countries. So in some cases, I've kind of sent a message ahead to them or called them and said, hey, do you know anybody who's kind of a crazy enough to kind of take a break from their job and come walk for me for a few weeks or even a few months? And so that's, you know, in that sense, I can, I can plan ahead. But on other occasions where I don't have those kind of connections, I just, it's kind of serendipity, it's word of mouth. So I'm walking with somebody in Turkey and that person has a friend in Georgia. And this literally happened. This, this, this Murat knew somebody who lived in a small town who then found a student, an 18 year old high school graduate who was game enough to come walk with me through, through part of Georgia. So it's often just serendipity too. It's, it's an interesting mix. All right, Mrs. Jacoby is joining us. Uh, her students are tuning in live from Maryland. Let me turn the mic on. Uh, actually, some of them might be in the call as well, but Mrs. Jacoby, do you have uh, any questions that came up for us? Yeah, we were wondering how, how Paul communicates with all these people. Is it, you know, his group must have a lot of languages under their belt. What, what, how, is he, how does he swing that? Yeah, that's, you know, you put your finger on probably the biggest obstacle to understanding. You know, I, in order to write about a place or to kind of tell a story about a place, it's important that you go beyond the surfaces, you, that you don't just tell a, a shallow story that you might kind of find on the internet, right? A YouTube uh, or, you know, some sort of meme, some sort of, because then you just start repeating stereotypes. You don't get at the heart of the, of the matter or you don't get to understand the complexity of every single living human being on this planet right now. And so language is key. It's really crucial. Now, I speak a few, but not nearly enough, right? Um, I speak Spanish fluently. I have a, an understanding of French. I have a, a kind of a rudimentary Russian. I know a few words of Arabic. Um, but what I really have to rely on for like detailed conversations beyond just, you know, hi, how are you? What you have for breakfast? But detailed conversations about the emotional lives of people, sort of what concerns them, what's on their mind, you know, how is their relationship with family, with their boss, with their community, that requires a pretty sophisticated understanding of language. And that's why these walking partners are crucial. And it's one of the kind of tests that I give to people when they come walk to me before I agree um, that they can come walk is that, you know, is your understanding of, of, of both the languages that we're walking through? Because keep in mind, folks, that some of these countries have multiple languages. It's not just one national language that they can speak those. And then also that their understanding of one of the languages that I speak is good enough that I can have a nuanced kind of conversation. So that's why these folks are, are really crucial to the project. All right, uh, Fiona, Fiona, if you wanna unmute your microphone for me, we'll take a question from you. Hold on. All right, we're ready for you. Um. Have you, have you ever had a problem with like people like cursing you or something? Like, cause some people do voodoo and stuff and like that. Like you ever had a bad experience with a people group? Good question, Fiona. Yeah, you know, people cursing me. I'll tell you right off the top of my head, it's mostly my editors back home for a breaking deadline. But um, seriously, um, there is some hostility you know, some, there have been occasions when, um, you know, you come into a strange place and people are frightened uh, and they may not trust you and there might be some, some hostility or you go to a rough neighborhood, you know, you don't know a city and you're walking through and every city in the world has its rough quarter, right? And if you kind of blunder into it, you can meet some aggressive people, right? So, but one of the great things, think about this, one of the great things about walking is that you're moving so slowly and that you're talking to enough people in every hour, never mind every day. I mean, you walk, you're passing by people every every hour, and you say hello, how you doing? And they say, hey, you know, you're not from here. Where are you going? And and I say, well, I'm going up to that place. If there's a problem at a place, if there's a problem with crime, if there's a problem with you know insecurity, if it's a war zone, 
I have an early warning system built in by having all these conversations. It's kind of a, a, you know, the people I meet even casually look out for me in most cases. And they'll say, you know what? You might not want to go to that village. You might not want to take that road. It's not safe. Why don't you go this way? So I think I've probably been saved a lot of trouble by just the, the structure of this journey being on foot. You know, I was a war reporter. And I can tell you that whenever I got into trouble in wars, it was always by moving too fast. It was driving into trouble without stopping and, and you know, asking people about what the situation was. So um, that said, I will tell you that the vast majority of interactions with people around the world, regardless of their culture, ethnicity, their religion, their politics, 95% plus have been positive and affirmative. Um, I'm trying to remember right now on this call if I've ever been robbed of anything. And I can't. I've been walking for seven years and I cannot tell you, it doesn't come to mind that I've been, you know, that a thief has approached me and taken something. That tells you something about um, danger, right? In the world. It tells you something about human nature. And it's not just me. It's not just, you know, who I am. Partly it's who I am in terms of I'm a man. It would be different if, you, if I were a woman, I'm sure. Um, I, I'm of a certain ethnic group. I'm white. That makes a difference, too. I'm carrying a certain passport. That makes a difference, too. I'm aware of that privilege. I'm a very privileged walker. Let me, make, let me be clear about that. I try to be sensitive to that. But also, I, I've just been with walking partners who are very different from me, women, people of, of color, what have you, um, people from, from that area. And they too have expressed amazement at how friendly their own citizens are um, to them um, when I'm not around. So it, it's, it's an affirming, it's been an affirming journey in that sense. All right, thanks for sharing that message, Paul. I think that's really important. We talk about this, I think every call uh, that we've had together the last few years is that yeah. on a whole, what we see in the media is not what's actually happening on the ground in a lot of countries. That's right. That's right. Um, let's see. There's a great question here. Uh, Death Eyes is wondering about what do you what do you do? Obviously, a lot of time you you pass by situations like the Syrian refugee situation where you know there's not a lot you can do to help. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you could help someone out? Yes. Yeah. You know, and I think being a, a, a journalist or a storyteller, there's sort of kind of like a, almost a, you know, how doctors have that famous Hippocratic oath of, of you know, do no harm. Um, I think journalists have that too. Um, and I think if you see somebody who's in an extreme situation, um, you, you help them first and then talk to them later. And I think that's, that's my, my kind of, um, method anyway, is that if I see somebody who's in dire straits, whether it's even if it's, look, even if it's something relatively trivial, like a broken down car, and I see it, you know, a kilometer ahead, and I'm inching toward it, and there's a family in it, or there's somebody who can't fix it, I, I stop and try to help them. And then, you know, we have a conversation, and I learn something about their lives. Going from that to kind of gathering up um, food for refugees, which I've done, um, yeah, but you know, the, one of the things I've got to try to point out, and it's, it's not a perfect world, but it doesn't always work. Um, maybe it doesn't even work most of the time. And it, but what I try to tell myself is that if you're an empathetic enough storyteller, perhaps the biggest gift that you can give is, is sharing somebody's story and making a difference in their lives that way. It doesn't happen a lot. You know, I've got to be honest. It's, you know, you, you can write your heart out and and be disappointed that nobody pays attention but that that would be the best outcome is to try to change people's lives for the better just by sharing their humanity through stories all right absolutely we're going to jump to david and ottawa his group is tuning in online i'm going to turn the mic on uh david you have a question for us i i do indeed um so one of the questions i think sort of stems from paul's previous comment it was um, about getting uh, what worries Paul or, or what sort of things, Paul, do you, are, are maybe scares you or worries you as you think about your journey? And I don't know if that's physical safety or 
just beyond that. Yeah. No, that's a really good question, you know, and I, and I, and I'm like everybody else. If you were walking David along with me, it would be the same with you. I think, you know, you, you know, I worry like anybody about physical um, uh, safety. If I'm moving into a zone of insecurity or if I'm crossing a large wilderness, like crossing 400 kilometers of the open steppes of Kazakhstan, it was pretty daunting. You know, I'd not been to that part of the world before. I'd done a lot of walking. I knew I can take care of myself, but this was completely new. And on top of that is the concern of being responsible for the people who are walking with you um, because you know I invite them to come along so I am responsible for their for their well-being and safety and then the last thing I want is for something bad to happen to them um, sure. and uh, I'll give you one example a concrete one in Saudi Arabia I was walking with this extraordinary gentleman Mohammed Banuna who was a desert survival expert and a great storyteller and a, a man with a tremendous sense of humor and he was lagging behind more and more as the, as the days and weeks were going by, which was unusual because he was in good shape. And finally, one morning as I was breaking camp, he didn't get up. And I went over to him in a city and I said, Muhammad, what's wrong? And he finally lifted his shirt and he had um, a wound in his abdomen that he hadn't told me about. He had had an operation, an abdominal ab operation that had come open and part of his um, um, intestine was coming out. And I was like, I mean, this is extraordinarily dangerous, right? Um, he could have died. So, of course, I immediately stopped the walk and we medevaced him back to Riyadh to a hospital. And he's now fine and he's doing great. He had to leave the walk. But that really, you know, frightened me because for a moment I thought I might lose a friend. So um, these are just kind of some anecdotal examples of, of the concerns that one might have um, that, that I have walking around the world. Um, and uh, but I must say again, I, I you know, I can pluck these memories very quickly and bring them up to you because they're so rare. It's one of the one of the amazing things about this walk is, and people, even my readers don't really believe me, is that it's actually been, you know, the biggest surprise of the walk is how extraordinarily easy it has been to get up every day, have a cup of tea at a camp or in a roadside stall or in some farmer's house and keep walking. It's just, it's just, it's, it's very easy. It's one of the easiest things in the world to walk around the world. All right, Paul, how's your time, Paul? Do you have time for a couple more questions? Sure, H happy to, yep. All right, awesome. Uh, I'm gonna turn on Kennington in North Carolina. Let me unmute your microphone uh, and let's get a question from your group. Okay, um, well, there's more question from me actually. Technology is a great and magical and wonderful thing because it's letting us all do this together right now. But listening to you and seeing what you've done, do you think that there's still enormous value in human conversation face to face, people just talking with each other? Yeah, well, you know, that's that's the definition of my project, really. It's one long conversation. It's a transcontinental conversation. Uh, that goes on every single day that I'm out here. And what's interesting is that on most days, it's with complete strangers. And that on most days, those conversations are rewarding. And on most days, I learn something new. And so I would say that I'm not putting down, I'm not, a, I'm not an anti-technologist at all. In fact, if I were alive 50,000 or 60,000 years ago, when our ancestors walked around the world, I probably wouldn't have survived because my eyesight is so bad that I've walked off a cliff so, you know, technology is probably literally keeping me alive to do this today. And the ability to talk to everybody on this call and share impressions and questions about this wild and crazy and changing world, uh, or to talk to my loved ones is something that, you know, my ancestors even two generations back couldn't do, right? You know, people traveling around the world, you know, 50, 60 years ago, still were writing letters to each other or telegrams. So um, it, it's, you know, technology is just a tool and it has no value to it, negative or positive. It's how we use it. So it always comes back to us. We can't blame our tools and only we are to blame if they're misused. Um, I do think that one of the, one of the tremendous gifts of the Out of Eden Walk is been the precious um, ability to have face-to-face -face interactions constantly uh, that are generally uh, overwhelmingly positive. And they're just something that cannot be replaced um, by uh, seeing somebody's face 
um, maybe clasping their hand, uh, watching their body language, listening to the intonation, the subtle ones of their voice as they tell a story about loss or about victory. Um, there's something that just resonates in the bones that's nourishing, right? It's emotional food. And at least for me, um, digital technology still hasn't managed to do that or match it. Um, so I have a great uh, combination of being able to tap into the best of this technology that we're using now to kind of that connects us as a global community. But at the same time, my days are filled with personal interactions that are uh, as old as, as the Pleistocene that go back to day one. All right, Paul, great question on YouTube. How many pairs, this is Rhonda, is wondering how many pairs of shoes have you gone through? Yeah, Rhonda, you know, I don't, I don't keep track. I, I, um, I think it's eight or nine maybe, or 10 by now. Um, and it, and it just really varies. It varies with, you know, the surfaces that I'm walking on. If it's car roads, they really wear out quickly. If I'm walking through sand deserts, they last longer. Um, um, and I, I generally wear, you know, a certain kind of hiking shoe. It's a, it's a Merrill shoe. It's really lightweight. Um, but I also have worn sandals. Um, I've worn, you know, cheap sneakers that I've bought in the local market, uh, just whatever's available. I've, I've been very lucky to have kind of feet made out of concrete. I don't get blisters. I don't have feet problems, at least not yet. Knock on wood. All right. Let's do a couple more questions from the students who are on the call with us. So let's start off with uh kaylee let me turn your microphone on oh kaylee you'll have to turn it on for me kaylee morgan okay so um my question was do you keep a um journal on your phone your laptop or do you write it old-fashioned hey kaylee great question again and you guys are great um with these questions um i, I do every i do all the, all of those now i'm a, i'm an old-fashioned type and that i've you know i have these uh notebooks that I keep filling up at the end of every day, you know, like my impressions, I jot them down. I find that writing something down with the pen and paper, it sort of sticks somehow better but for me, at least it just kind of, it, it, the memory becomes kind of cemented. Um, whereas um, when I'm walking along, let's say I'm leading a camel or I'm trying to keep up with a, you know, uh, homie, my walking partner through the hills of Northeastern India who walks very fast and I don't have time to stop and, and do that. I pull out my phone, which I generally have turned off except for navigational uses. I, you know, I don't have the voice turned on and I, I'll tap in a, you know, a note on uh, notepad on my phone. I find it, you know, that's kind of an emergency for me because I find it, it's pretty, it makes extra work because then I have to transcribe that stuff back into my notebook. Um, so it's like double work. Uh, so the real, the real stuff is on paper. All right. Uh, Kate's iPhone, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Um, so I was wondering if, like, I wanted to know what you were talking about when you were walking with like, your walking park thing. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. Could you repeat? Um, what were you talking about with your walking partners? Like, what did you talk about? Did they like tell you stories or like, what did you talk about? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a lovely question because the answer is really lovely. You know, there's something about walking. I don't know if it's, it's the same with you when you go walking with your friends, but you, people just open up when they're walking, you know, it's, it's different than sitting in a room and chatting when you get out and take a walk, whether you're on a hike or just walking to the store or just around the park or to school or whatever there's something about the movement of the body that kind of loosens up people's minds and hearts. And so it really makes um, building friendships very easy and it, and it happens more quickly. I find that I get to know people and they get to know me. We share, I guess, things more easily when we're walking along a, you know, a country trail through the Punjab. Uh, we talk about our lives. We talk about, you know, the difficulties of the day with a problem to solve at that time. We get to know each other really well. Uh, and everything under the sun is open for conversation. It really depends on the person, right? You know, some people are shyer than others. Some people have, you know, more specific interests than others. But by the end of a couple of weeks, and certainly by the end of a few months, um, I get to know my walking partners so well, they're almost like family. And to the degree that I've got this idea that at the end of the walk, when I reach the tip of South America, Tierra del Fuego, you know, about six or seven years from now, 
I'm going to fly all these folks that walk with me somehow. I'll, I'll do it somehow. I'm going to find some, you know, big philanthropist, um, maybe who owns an airline or something, to get them tickets to join me for the last 10 kilometers to walk down to the Beagle Channel to the Antarctic Sea together. It'll be a big party and we'll all walk. There'll be hundreds of people. Think about it. There'll be Ethiopian camel herders. There'll be Saudi uh, desert survival experts. There'll be a Kurdish photojournalist. Um, there'll be, you know, writers from India, uh, mountain climbers from Burma. It'll just be a giant big family. Um, everybody who shared this journey and we're just going to walk together and have a picnic on the beach. All right. Sounds pretty incredible, Paul. I want to check in with Mr. Let's see, Mr. Mazki in Wisconsin. Have we picked a couple of your students? I know we have them in the call. Uh, I have a few that are just waiting. So either Brooke, Abby or Sawyer. Okay. I'll jump over to one of them now. So Brooke, let me turn your microphone on. Or Brooke, you'll have to unmute for me. What kind of food did you eat on your trip? Yeah, food's important on, on, a, on a project like this because, you know, you're burning energy all the time. Um, I walk anywhere from just a couple kilometers to 40 kilometers a day. It just depends on the situation. So you have to keep the engine stoked, right? But because you're only able to carry what you're able to carry on your rucksack, you know, your, your rucksack is your house, um, you can't carry a lot. And what does that mean? That translates into basically grazing the landscape living off the land, living and eating with, um, uh, eating with other people around you are eating. So my diet has changed radically across the walk. It started, you know, in Africa, um, where, you know, people were in some cases eating, you know, wild game, um, to walking through the Middle East where I was eating a lot of lamb, you know, pretty meat heavy, uh, diet. Um, and then, through India, part big chunks of India, it was vegetarian, right? Lentils with, with rice, dal with rice. So um, it helps to have a, a forgiving um, uh, palate. You know, it, it helps to be not too picky uh, when you're on a project like this so that you can enjoy local cuisine, uh, including the spices, right? Which I love. I grew up in Mexico, so I like spicy food. But it, it changes every every few hundred kilometers. It's some new new something new is on the menu. All right, and we'll take one more question from Sawyer. So Sawyer, I just lost you on my screen. Let me. There we go. Go ahead, Sawyer. Um. So how many days and stuff have you been walking? Okay. Yeah, Sawyer. Let me. I know I can't give you like a really accurate count. Um. But in, on January of this year, it was seven years. So what is it now? Like more than seven. So doing the math, um, I don't know. Is that like between 2,500 or 3,000 days? I, you know, somebody's got to help me out with this. But <laughs> it's been a few, a few days and nights on the trail. And I'm about, you know, more or less chronologically, not geographically in, in kilometers, but chronologically, I think I'm about at the halfway mark. Mark, I have a long way to go. I've got to walk across uh, China and hopefully Siberia, and then all the way down uh, the western seaboard of the American continent, from Alaska down to uh, Chile and Argentina. So, a ways to go. Got to pace myself, just like we all have to pace ourselves during this pandemic, folks. I mean, wrapping up. My message is just, you know, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint, obviously. So take care of yourselves. Take care of your health. Eat right. Exercise uh, so that you're, you know, ready to go, come out the gate when, when the quarantines finally lift. All right, Paul, you're absolutely right. It's over 2,500 days. And you just answered the million-dollar question. I think this has come up over a dozen times on YouTube. How much longer to go? So it sounds like maybe another seven or so years. So maybe halfway. Yes. Yes, that's right. All right, very cool. Well, to wrap up today, I want to let everyone know you can check out Explorer Classroom and many, many more educational resources at natgeoed.org. Uh, we have another event going today at 2 p.m. Eastern. You can meet a deep sea tech, uh, Brennan Phillips. We'll talk about some of the work he does studying deep sea sharks, hydrothermal vents, and underwater volcanoes. So it should be pretty wild. A huge thank you to all the classes and students and families who joined us via YouTube. Thanks for your amazing questions. 
Huge thank you to everybody on the call today. Great to see so many students' faces, so many teachers representing their classrooms. It's great to still make this learning happen uh, in this community. And then Paul, as always, a pleasure. It's been great hosting you the last several years, and I look forward to many, many more of these events as you continue to move uh, through our amazing planet. No, it's great. Great to be walking together with this larger community and basically learning together as we go. So looking forward to the next time. Thank all you. right. So let me turn all the mics on. Uh, boys and girls, get nice and loud. A big thank you for Paul. Thank you. It was a Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank right. you. Thanks, everyone. We are signing off for today.